We are in the book of Jude this morning. And for those of you who have not sat with me, my name is Randy. I'm one of the elders here at the church. And I'm going to be speaking with you this morning about communion. But uh, we're going to take a trip around the Bible. And if you know me very well, you would be surprised if that were not the case. (laughs) So uh, I'm going to ask you, please open your Bibles, have them in your lap, and uh, we're going to share some things. Some of these things may be somewhat uncomfortable. I pray that they're not. I pray that you know the spirit with which I would share them because we love you. The Lord loves you, and it is our desire that you would grow closer and closer to him, that the things that are not of God would fall away, and that what would remain is that intimacy that you were created for with the Lord. So it is in the book of Jude that we begin this morning with verse 3. Beloved, my dear children was the translation that Stacy was reading from or reciting this morning in the NLT. And that's why I couldn't use mine and that's why I asked you to close yours. I teach from the New King James Version. Some of you may have others. But uh, what I find many times when somebody is sharing from memory is that we start to examine what's in our lap and comparing the differences instead of just letting that truth of what she shared get from here to here. And uh, I've watched her do that with several books several times, and I will tell you, uh, it always moves my heart. But here in this third verse, it says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation... That was his desire. He was excited about the common salvation that was given to all men through Jesus Christ. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Listen to me, dear ones, and you're going to hear me say this several times today. Satan desires to sift you like wheat. And he's calling us to earnestly contend. That means have your Bible open. That means have your prayer life active. Let everything you do in word or deed be done for the glory of God. Let your lives become worship. The very next breath you take is a gift from God. Return it to him. And so we go on in verse 4. It says, for certain men have crept in unnoticed. These are people that come in and we gently begin to drift away from the truth. We find people today who stand and um, share philosophy at a Sunday morning service instead of teaching the word. And some of that philosophy leads us away from the truth of God's word. And in the midst of a storm, we have no anchor. Who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he goes on in verse 5 through verse 11 to remind them of things that they should know. And I'm not going to spend time in that this morning as it's already been covered. But then when he references these things, he doesn't give you chapter and verse. He says you should know these things. Saints, my dear brothers and sisters, some of you young in your faith, some of you more well-seasoned, some of you may not be in the faith yet. This is, in fact, the word of God. And so what we're going to, when he makes reference to these things, he's taken for granted that the people he's speaking to are exercised in the word of God. And so we want to be those people, amen? amen? And so we continue on. He says in verse 12, and this is where the emphasis is going to come. And then from here, if you want to mark yourself out, I'm going to be going to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So you can put your thumb there. But right now, let me share this with you. These are spots in your love feasts. My dear brothers and sisters, we are going to have a love feast here today. We're going to share in communion. My dear brother Fred, on Friday night a couple of weeks ago, shared that fellowship in the Greek is a term koinonia. Koinonia is such a strong word that we really don't have a, an equivalent for it in the English language. But basically, as I understand it in a nutshell, it means that we become one. 
that we're nourished from the same loaf, that we are partakers in that which is the body of Christ, which is not given to the world, but is given to you and I. And so we have something special, and he, he wants us to keep it that way. And so he says, these have become spots, while they feast with you without fear. So there are those who would come into the church and bring sin with them, and in our permissiveness, we allow it to the point where, and listen, I'm not a sin sniffer, but we need to be those who are turning our hearts to God. Certainly, in every church, we are sinners. We are saved by grace. But he has called us to the place where we're not to remain in sin. And so, a church that, per, that does not teach about that is failing to serve you. Because we're called away from that because Satan wants to tear us up. But it goes on here, it says, They are clouds without water, carried about by the wind, carried about with every wind of doctrine, tossed to and fro in other places, it tells us in Scripture. Late autumn trees without fruit. This time of year, and of course now we're a little past that, but we like to go to our fruit trees and then harvest from those fruit trees the sweet nutrients of good fruit. But if a fruit tree does not bear fruit, it is no good to us. And then these are not just not good to us, they're twice dead, which means they've been uprooted. It means they, again, have no mooring. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up to their own shame, wandering stars from whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Okay, these are very strong words, my dear saints. But I want to encourage you this morning let us not be of those that are numbered here. And if we are those, that we would be called to repentance. There's a song that says it is the kindness, and it's from the book of Romans, it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. In the book of Philippians, it says, He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it unto the day of Christ Jesus. If you are here today, as you are listening to this with me, understand something. God ain't done with you yet. And he's not done with me either. And he's calling us. He's calling us out of the things of the world and into the fellowship of his precious saints. We're going to conclude with the book of Jude, so we'll be back to that. But now I'd like you to go over to the book of Corinthians. Speaking about these spots in our love feast, Paul in the book of Corinthians, the 11th chapter, is going to talk about a little bit about communion. Now, we will go back to this chapter as we celebrate the communion today, but at this time, I want to go down to the 27th verse, and I want to share some things with you from that, because, listen clearly, God wants us healed. God wants us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and to be thriving in the Spirit and in the truth, I had a dear brother yesterday sharing from the book of 2 John, and he was talking about the spirit of truth. Truth without the Holy Spirit is legalism. But truth in the Holy Spirit delivers us from death. Verse 27, therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord, this is that feast that we're talking about, in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. What that's saying is that you're not taking this in, in the sense of which it was given. You're allowing it to, to, to it, you take it unchanged. We have two sacraments in the church, the sacrament of baptism, which once you're born again, you're called to be baptized, and the sacrament of communion. In the sacrament of communion, Jesus himself said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And if you know me very well, you know that communion is one of my favorite services. And there's a lot I'd like to share about it, but I believe this is what the Lord has given me this morning. And so we continue on here. Let us not be guilty of that, but let a man examine himself, verse 28, and let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So examine. What we do, 
It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And as we're going through the word and we're convicted of what we've done that is short of the glory of God, when we come to communion, it's that time to say, Lord, please forgive me. And to know that we are forgiven and we can partake of that cup. He who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Listen very closely. This is, this is where I want to go with this. For this reason, many are weak, weak in the faith, and sick. We're sick. We're emotionally sick. We're psychologically sick. We end up physically sick because we're not doing what God has created us for, which is to bring glory to him, to have unity with him. And so we come back to that place of communion. This year... $326 billion will be spent in the United States on uh, mental disorders and, and, and uh, spiritual, uh, psychological things going on. $134 million will be spent on health care and medicine. $134 billion. $20.3 billion will be lost in work related calling in being off work over 37 billion will be lost in productivity and it says for there are many who are weak and sick among you and many sleep listen very closely dear ones that sleeping there is that we're asleep here in the body of Christ we're asleep because we're not allowing the word of God to move us and to change us to rend our hearts and to bring us to the place where we can say, Lord, fill me. Lord, cleanse me. Lord, take me. Use me as you want me to be. That is what we are celebrating. For if we would judge ourselves, then we would not be judged. Now listen, that judgment is not into condemnation. It is for conviction. And in that conviction comes restoration and comes renewal and revival. Now, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to the book of James, and then hold your finger in James chapter 5, and then we're going to take a look at a couple of places in the book of Jude, and then we're going to be in 1 Peter. And in case you were wondering, uh, I just, I'm so excited about this, and yet I feel that it's something that uh, God is not just speaking to me. I pray he's speaking to all of us. But in the book of James, the fifth chapter in the 13th verse, it says, is any among you suffering? You know what? There are people that say, when I get it together, I'll come to church. <laughs> Listen to me. Come to church and you'll get it together. Come to a fellowship that's rightly dividing the word of truth, loving one another, serving one another, and you will put off the things of the flesh to put on the things of the spirit. Is any of you suffering? Let him pray. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. In all things give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you, which is from the book of Thessalonians. Is any of you cheerful? Let him sing psalms. This joy that I have in my heart. The Lord didn't give it, and the, I'm sorry, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. And so he says, is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him or her in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save. Notice it doesn't say heal. It says save the sick. And the Lord will raise him or her up. And if he or, her is, he or she has committed any sins, they will be forgiven. I'm, I'm putting a different pronoun in there. I, I don't want to add to or take, but it doesn't matter. Guy, gal, we all need this. And then I want to share with you this morning about what it is. Why do we call for the elders? A long time ago, I had a fella that uh, had mentioned that uh, he did not particularly believe in anointing with oil. And so he shared Listen, I don't know that I particularly believe that, but Randy does, and Randy always carries oil. And 
I'm going to share a little bit about that this morning because sometimes I think in the past it's been misused because we didn't know God's word well. But go back and look at what we're talking about today. It says that he will save the sick. So many times we're anointed with oil and we are anointed for a healing and God does heal and God can do miracles. He's still in the miracle business. But along with that, it's to call for the elders of the church and that the elders are to anoint and then that opens the door for ministry. Those of us who are exercised in the word and, and of course there are elders, Jordan, uh, our pastor, Pastor Jordan and, and, uh, pa and uh, Fred and Doug, who's not here, myself today, uh, others in the, in the church would be able to serve in that capacity, but we don't just simply anoint. What that does is helps us to come to the place where we begin to ask questions, or you can ask us questions, and then we can provide for you answers from the Word of God that heals your heart, draws you closer to Jesus, and you have a vibrant walk with God. That's why we do that. And I'm going to give you some examples. In the book of Revelation, the 12th, I'm sorry, the, the, the 5th chapter and uh, around uh, the 4th verse. But in the book of Revelation, the term elders is used about a dozen times. Many times in the Revelation, the elders are those who are gathered around the throne, bringing glory to God, worshiping the Lord, 24 elders. But then there are other places like the one we're about to read now or the next place, which will be uh, Revelation chapter 7, verse 13, where we're going to see an elder doing something and, and, and it's instructional to us. Look at Revelation chapter 5, picking up at verse 4. Actually, I'm going to drop back to verse 1. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with the seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to lose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. This is the title deed to the earth, written on the inside and on the outside. There was no one worthy to take the scroll or to loose the seals thereof. And John says in verse 4, so I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and to read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, a lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood the lamb as though it had been slain, having seven heads or seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into the earth. And he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. John wept much until the elder said, John, don't weep. Sometimes we come and we weep much. And if, for those of us who are exercised in the word, I would encourage you speak into the lives of others. Let the Holy Spirit speak into your life through the knowledge of the word. Do not weep. Behold the Lamb of God. You know, saints, we've got things going on in the world right now that if you're not a believer, it horrifies you. But if we are a believer, like we see at the end of the Revelation, we can say, even so, Lord, come quickly. And now in Revelation chapter 7, verse 13. Chapter 7, verse 13. And what we see here, uh, go back and read this. I, I'm giving you these. Go back and read the context. I'm, I, I'm pulling them out, but I want you to have the context. Here it is. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? So there were those around arrayed in white robes given to them by the Lord. And the elder asked the question, You know what? That's my job. That's my job. My job is to ask you questions. How you doing? Okay, not how you feeling. It's not about your emotions. I want to know how you're doing in the Lord. Do you understand? And then you can say, no, I don't. 
Then one of the elders asked, uh, answered me, saying, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. You can do that. You can do that. And he said to me, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They, therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. How's that for good news? How's that for the full gospel? Because that's what elders should be delivering. We have that hope. You and I have that hope in Christ Jesus that one day we will be with our Lord. And this is the promise. Now, these are those that come out of the tribulation, but elders are going to share with that. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne, remember that Lamb we saw back there in chapter 4 or chapter 5? will shepherd them and lead them to the living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The original no more tears formula. <laughs> now, I'd like you to go back. If you haven't figured it out yet, we're doing a little jumping around in the Word of God. Now I'd like you to go back to the book of First Peter. In Timothy, Paul writing in his last epistle to Timothy says, Study to show yourself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, don't turn there, we've got somewhere else. But in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says that you and I, dear brothers and sisters, need to be ready to give to any man that asks a reason for our hope in Christ Jesus. And so in that sense, we are doing the work of ministry. We're to live out our lives in such a way that others would see it and say, why are you different? Why is it that this doesn't shake you up? Oh, you ask. Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about what he done on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. Let me tell you about the one that is greater than David, who came from the lineage of David, born 1,000 years after King David reigned. And about the one that is the fulfillment of the promise of Abraham 2,000 years before he walked among men and 4,000 years from today. Let me tell you why I have hope in the midst of a failing world. This world will fail. My Savior will not. Amen. And so it is in 1 in Peter, the fifth chapter, Peter writing to the church and to those of the dispersia, The elders who are among you, I exhort. Fathers, I exhort you. Grandfathers, I exhort you. Young men, I exhort you. You ladies who are seasoned in years, I exhort you. Isn't it tactful the way I just did that? <laughs> we should be ready to give to any man that asks a reason for our hope. Now, Chapter 5, verse 1. The elders who are among you, I exhort. I am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God. Pastor Jordan, it is not his responsibility to usher us into the kingdom. It is his responsibility to rightly divide the word of God and that we as a body and beyond the doors of this church would invite others to come along as we're brought into the Lord. Amen? He says, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those who are entrusted to you, but to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. Yeah. Saints, that is our promise. 
that is our promise. Let us live in the promise. Standing on the promises of God my King. Through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Shouting, I lost it. Standing on the promises of God. You fill in the blank. See, it doesn't just happen. But here we are. This is what we're encouraged to do this, this morning. And he, so we come back to the book of Jude. And in the book of Jude, I want to share a couple of things. And I told you some of this would be hard to receive. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not trying to undress anybody. But I would ask you, ask yourself, am I under this sway? And if I am, what am I going to do about it? Because in just a moment, we're going to take communion. And I would ask today, if there is anything going on that would separate you from having that opportunity, let's get it under the blood right now. And so it is, there were some things that he said in verse 16 about these who are given to the flesh. They are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust. Listen, this happens in the church. Let us not be those who would grumble and complain and find fault with what we are doing, but whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are righteous, think on these things. And the peace of God that passeth all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You want to put a holy vault around your mind? If you find yourselves in these places, repent and come back before God. And saints, we've all done it. We've all done it. Walking according to their own lust, they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, but you, beloved, but you, Calvary South Cheyenne, but you who are with us today, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude is writing this. He's probably one of the last men standing, and he's going, listen to what these godly men have told you in the past, these representatives, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. You know, we have the Internet, and we are flooded with things on YouTube and, and one place and another of all these different heretical teachings. And we have... And, and sometimes you just feel like throwing your Bible up in the wind and walking away. Don't do it. Don't do it. James would say earlier in this, in this book, in chapter 5, draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Resist the enemy, and he will flee. These are sensual persons who cause divisions not having the Spirit. Pray for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. But you, beloved, but you, my dear friends, build yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. What does that look like? Well, sometimes, many, many, many years ago, when Calvary Chapel first started, and I had a full head of hair, um, Actually, it was before. <laughs> but many years ago, Pastor Chuck wrote a book called Charisma versus Charismania. And in that, he talked about the sincerity of being led by the Spirit versus the sensationalism of drawing attention to ourselves. And so it is that this here, praying in the Spirit, open your Bibles. Pray through the Word. Pray through the Ten Commandments. Pray through the Lord's Prayer. If you know the Apostles' Creed, pray through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father. Amen? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Immaculate Conception, the sinless life, the propitiatory death, when He died on the cross for me, that He rose again on the third day, that He ascended into heaven, and He's coming back. Pray through that. And even so, Lord, come quickly. Pray through the Ten Commandments. 
the Lord's Prayer. Go to chapter 17 of the book of John. Look how Jesus prayed. And pray alongside of him. Lord, I not only pray for these, but I pray for those who will become believers because of their testimony. Saints, there are vacant chairs in this church today. There are people who need to hear the gospel. And you may be the one to deliver it. Let us be those people. And if you think that I'm a little bit passionate today, you are absolutely right. This is what happens when you let a preacher take a a hiatus for a while. (laughs) Ultimately, let me finish this up as we get ready for communion. It says, keep yourselves in the love of God. You do that by the knowledge of the word, by prayer, by fellowship. The Bible says, do not forsake the gathering together of the brethren, such is the manner of some. It is good to be in church together. Okay? Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. As as my dear uh, brother, my son-in-law, my friend, my pastor said this morning, mercy is chesed. Think about that. You know, today we're celebrating in communion the grace and the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. Of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. On some have compassion, making distinction. What does that say? What it says is that if somebody is stumbling, if somebody's having a hard time, come alongside of them. Walk with them. Encourage them. Speak, in, speak encouragement. On others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments that are defiled by the flesh. That literally means sometimes we have to say, and it's never popular, If you continue down this road, you will be damned. And we need to be able to say it in love, not judgment. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before his presence, uh, of his presence, uh, of his glory, with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. So I have one more place that I'm going to take you back to. We're going to go back to the 11th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. Jesus Christ gave us the first communion. Paul, many years later, at the church at Corinth, would say, that which I have now received, I now bring to you. He wasn't at the first communion. He was at Saul. He persecuted the church. But when he was arrested by Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he surrendered to Jesus Christ as Lord, the Lord again allowed him to be partaker of a communion. We weren't at the first communion either. But we're at this one today. And I would ask you, is there anything, and I plead with you, that would keep you from enjoying this time of fellowship, this kinenia? If you are not a believer, let this cup pass you by. If you are a believer and you've struggled with sin, do not let this cup pass you by. This is the time of repentance and regeneration and renewal. If you are not a believer, we're going to pray and we're going to ask that if you were here today and you know not Christ, that you would receive Christ and that this would be your first communion. And if you've been here and you're walking with God, let us once again come to the place of sweet fellowship as we return to worship, and then we celebrate communion together. And I'll ask the worship team to come as I pray. Father, we're going to be praying a few more times this morning. But your word tells us to pray without ceasing, so I think we're okay. But Lord, right now, in this community center that for the last hour and a half has been a sanctuary, 
a hiding place, a place of refuge, a place of your spirit. Lord, if there are any who are here this morning, I would ask, Lord, search their hearts. If they do not know you, Lord, let them confess you as their Savior. For without you, Lord, we have no hope. Lord, as we pray, if there's anyone here that would like to invite Christ into their lives, we're just going to pray right now, and then we're going to go to worship. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would receive our hearts. Our Savior, our precious, precious one. We have come so far short of the glory that you have intended for us or that we might partake in when we see you face to face. Lord, forgive us. Forgive our sins. You promised us you would. You promised us that if we confess our sin, that you were faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, I confess to you now. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Cast us not away from the joy of salvation. And Lord, let us now bring worship to you as our blessed Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.